What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of The Hookshots Podcast. Yeah, I am your host, Joe Cermelli. And you know, in our last podcast just two short weeks ago, uh, which was very early March, uh, here I was lamenting about that in like a lion phase of uh, my least favorite month of the year. And you know, hey, you know, I look, I know all of you guys are, are very far from out of the woods, but I am happy to report that just two short weeks later, um, I was just sitting here with the door open um, in, in HSHQ, feeling the the cool, crisp 64-degree uh, breeze blowing in. Uh, so things are happening. I still hate this month, but, you know, we're, we're getting somewhere here. It smells like spring. I actually uh, watched a robin this morning eat a worm off the front lawn, and I guess the worm was uh, up to temperature enough that it did not immediately freeze the blood in the veins of the robin and kill it instantly. So, great, great. It's it's starting to look like spring and smell like spring. And uh, around this time, late, you know, mid to late March, um, you know, one thing that, that comes to mind when you're, you're thinking about spring kickoffs where I live is opening day of trout season. Now, for our brethren uh, listening in, you know, places like, I don't know, the Rocky Mountains, you know, stuff like that, you're going, what the hell is an opening day at trout season, man? I know. You you don't know what that is. You know why you don't know what that is? Because you actually have real trout. Like, they're real, um, you know, worthy wild fish, worthy of, of your time. Uh, to go out there and chase 365 days a year, you know, in the middle of the winter for the hardcore out there in the Rocky Mountains, man. You have not, uh, most of you, had the pleasure of catching a rainbow trout that looks like somebody, like, put it in the blender for one pulse, okay? That is a rite of passage here in the Northeast, okay? I don't want to fish with perfect fins. I want clipped nubbins, I want the fish to look slightly diseased, and when I'm catching that fish, I want to do it standing next to 300 other people, damn near shoulder to shoulder in some situations, who all want that fish on a stringer and to take it home and eat it. Truck trout, man. Truck trout. Josie uh, and a lot of other people listen to this. That's what you were raised on. Truck trout. They grew up in a cement raceway, Uh, but, you know, all the same, you know, you say what you want about the fish. Opening day of trout season is a huge thing here in the Northeast, Um, you know, and I know that doesn't apply to to every state, but I know this is a big deal too, like in Arkansas and Missouri, where there are a lot of, quote, trout parks with stocked fish, Um, and not every state has an open or closed season, um, you know. But Pennsylvania, New Jersey in particular, I believe like Connecticut and Massachusetts, anywhere that there's a huge stocking program, there's usually a kickoff day. And quite literally for the uninitiated, uh, the way it works is like, you know, opening morning in Jersey is it's it's always the second Saturday of April. And, you know, you go out there uh, five o'clock in the morning to get your spot, but you can't fish until 8 a.m., and, you know, in a lot of these places, here comes the ranger and like blowing the horn at eight o'clock. And it's just like, a you know, a thousand casts of power bait and spinners into the hole. And the whole thing is a gigantic penis measuring contest. OK, which is sort of part of the charm. OK, I want my limit. I'm going to limit out. I'm going to limit out in 20 minutes. OK, I want the breeder. Everybody wants the breeder. OK, or the limit. Or if you want to get really crazy, the uh, the Palomino man, the the big orange, dopey, weird, genetically mutated rainbow trout, right? That is such a northeast thing, especially Pennsylvania, man. It's like you can see him from a mile away, and if I had a, a dollar for every time I've seen twenty guys standing around a hole just carpet bombing a poor. Palomino trout, man, I would be rich. Um, but you know, again, it's just it's part of the culture. And opening day was a big part of my fishing growing up. You know, uh, when you're little enough where you have to rely on dad to take you out, and, and typically it was my dad 
and my grandfather that would uh, take me out on opening day in Jersey. And, you know, there were so many sort of other experiences tied to that. It's not just the going out, right? It's it's that trip to the tackle shop in the days or the week before to buy new power bait and to buy a fresh jar of Mike's cheese eggs. And we always had mealworms and garden worms. And, you know, I, I, some guys are Meps guys, man. The Cermelli family threw Panther Martins, damn it. You know what I mean? And there was a buzz in the tackle shop. There's guys in there gearing up for this. You know, I miss that. You don't see that very much anymore. But, you know, as a little kid, you know, you're in these tackle shops looking at these dusty, you know, horrid skin mounts of, of these, you know, breeders, you know, the big uh, the big dummies, the big coveted prize. And, um, you know, that was the guy you, you dreamed of being, the guy on the stream opening morning, uh, you know, walking back to the truck at Stony Brook, with some, you know, five pound nasty beat up brook trout on a chain stringer. And, you know, my dad and, and grandfather took me religiously every year. And for me as a little kid, and I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate, like, oh my God, the anticipation. Like, I couldn't sleep. Like, that was better than Christmas morning. And, you know, this is long before the days of cell phones and Facebook and instant gratification of information. So, you know, you can't, like, check the weather on your phone every 10 seconds. So, like, you know, you look at the long-term forecast in the newspaper, and a couple of days before, you'd be like, Dad, is it, is it going to be good? Is it going to be nice? And, oh, man, you know, God bless my dad, right? But he is a fair-weather fisherman. He always has been. And, oh, dude, there were a handful of opening day eaves when they were calling for like torrential rain the next day or snow in April. And, you know, just like Christmas morning, you'd get, I'd get up at five in the morning and there were a few and he was like, ah, uh, yeah, we ain't going. And you're just crushed. I cried. I would cry tears. That's how badly I wanted to go out on opening day. And then even if it is a nice day and then you get out there like, yeah, you are just like a I, – I, I remember just being like a ball of little nerves until there was at least one trout on a stringer. There's nothing worse when you're a 7, 8-year-old kid on opening day than watching all these other dudes just like loading up the chain and, you know, and you're stroking it. It's horrible. It's horrid. And then, you know, you have to bring them all home to show your mom, right, because she gives a shit. Uh, but, she, you know, she pretended to. And you take pictures in the backyard with your little vest on – and then your dad pan fries these trout and you take one bite as a seven, eight year old kid and realize this tastes like shit and you don't eat any of it. And it ends up being just like forked off of the plates into garbage cans and thus concludes opening day of trout traditions. And, you know, this was a tradition that was upheld, um, you know, with my dad through, I don't know, probably my sophomore year of college, okay? But, you know, the game changed as as I got older, particularly when, you know, uh, some buddies of mine got their driver's licenses and I got my driver's license. You know, then, then, then like, now, like, like, we're the big dogs, you know? And my old man was never about, um, you know, <laughs> getting out there at 5 in the morning to hold a spot. Like, we'd just show up at Rosedale Lake, you know, a half hour before the bell, and uh, you get whatever spot you get. He didn't care. But then, you know, as I got more serious about fishing, you know, me and my buddies, yeah, hell yeah, we damn near pitch it to every, you know, everything but pitch a tent. You know, you show up like idiots at like two in the morning to stand there and freeze your nuts off, not making a cast until eight o'clock for what, you know? But at the time, you know, for what was to be the man. To be the guy. And it's so stupid because, like, my dad would meet us later. So, like, he would take his sweet time and, like, meet me and one of my buddies, you know, on some North Jersey River later. And, like, he'd get there at, like, 9 o'clock ready to fish. And, like, we'd be sitting there like, oh, dude, we limited, like, 20 minutes. Like, 20 minutes. We were limited. Got my limit. We limited. You know, you're shouting it. So, like, the dudes downriver who are not in the hole that they that that you're in but want to be can hear you. It's, oh, it's, 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 it's a total shit show. It's a total shit show. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I slowly, uh, but surely uh, later in college and then as I started my career, I fell out of that scene for, uh, you know, a number of reasons. And um, I, I, I want to go on record right here and right now and say that I am, am not a, a trout fly snob. I have no problem soaking a worm for trout. 
I have no problem throwing a stick bait for trout. I, I harbor no ill will against anybody next to me while I'm fly fishing running a garden worm. Could care less. Um, so it was not a matter of, of like becoming the fly guy that will only fly fish for trout um, because I'm not and I, I'm still not. I, do I fly fish more than anything else? Yes, I do. Um, do I still occasionally get a wild hair to grab a spinning rod and some trout magnets, go up to Lockwood Gorge? Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. But what changed for me, uh, it was less the method, right, and more the fish themselves. You know, as I got older and, and started going to, like, the upper Delaware and traveling a bit and fishing some of the limestoners in western PA, you know, you, you develop this appreciation for, quote, real trout, you know, wild trout. And you start to appreciate the difference, uh, you know, in a 20-inch wild hook jaw perfect upper Delaware brown trout versus a not perfect 20-inch truck brown trout, you know, that that's just beat to death. Um, I just sort of, I, like, trout fishing for me became wild trout. Like I just, I, I, I sort of lost my drive, you know, to go beat up on truck trout in the local rivers. And I'm not taking anything away from the guys who still love that. That's awesome. Like I said, it's culture. Now, the light at the end of the tunnel is even though I have, like, you won't catch me on opening day in Jersey or PA anywhere. Um, I, I want to do that again with my kids. I look forward to that as my kids get older, uh, because now that I'm older and I'm, I'm over that whole like competition, you know, of opening day thing, that phase is long gone. I I think it'll be fun to do it again very low drag. You know what I mean? Like, just do what my old man did. Roll up at 7.30. If we catch a couple, we catch a couple. If not, you know, who cares? You know, I look forward to letting my kids pick whatever color power bait they want and marveling at the worms because that's what I did when I was a kid. I was a bait fisherman to the core, and that's really... What we're talking about today is bait fishing for trout. Now, some of you longtime Devote Hookshots fans, I'm sure, are very familiar with the Mealy Master episode of Hookshots. This is going back, oh man, five, six years ago now. I filmed an episode with my friend Matt Weddish up in Connecticut. And uh, Matt's whole shtick is fishing mealworms for trout. That's all he does. Now, he's versed, as we'll learn, in all kinds of trout fisheries. But mealworms are this dude's deal. And I think that a lot of people, fly guys especially, sorry, fly guys, you look at bait dunkers as like dummies. Like that's dumbed down trout fishing. You know, anybody can just go drift a worm down the run. Okay, and that's true to an extent. But I kid you not, um, <laughs> You know, people look at fly fishing like art. Matt Weddish makes drifting mealworms for trout art, okay? He has a system. His gear is tailored. Every piece of the puzzle that goes into what he does um, has been figured out through years of trial and error and experimentation. And some of you who don't know Matt or haven't seen that episode are going, get the hell out of here, dude. It's mealworm drifting. No, no. I have never met a trout fisherman more dialed with bait than Matt. And when I went to shoot that episode, the whole time I was thinking in my head, what the hell am I doing? Like, I'm going to go film an entire show around mealworm fishing. And no joke, I think in terms of teaching, um, I've never put an episode together that taught more people a new skill. And Matt can back that up just based on the feedback he got after that episode and, and the years of people reaching out and going, Hey man, I adopted your way of doing this. And like, I cannot believe how much more productive I am. So even though we filmed with Matt all those years ago, you know, it's been a while. So I thought, you know, with all these opening days sort of pending, right? We all got spring fever. Um, what a great time to catch up with Matt, see what he's been up to since that episode. And I think this podcast allows us to get into a little bit more depth about exactly what it is he is doing with his mealworms. Okay. Um, and I promise you, man, you adopt some of this stuff, you'll be shocked. Okay. 
And here's the thing. Even if you have no idea what this truck trout deal is about, you have wild trout. Okay, You live out in the West, whatever. Um, I dare you, Montana boys. Okay, Do what Matt's doing with mealworms, and your numbers will skyrocket. Wild trout eat a mealworm just as quick. Well, it looks like we're doing the same thing. Yeah, it does look like we're doing the same thing. We're both drinking <laughs> fine bourbon, aren't we? <laughs> that is exactly what we're doing. I, have I? Have I? Is this still a good time for you at Mealy Master Industries yeah. up there? <laughs> no, man, I'm good. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to rock, bro. So we, you and I talked last night about this, and uh, for people who don't know, Matt has the most ridiculous collection of bourbon in the man cave bar, and uh, even though even though it's a, it might be a hair early for JC, I, look, there's the. There's the ice clinking, if you can hear that. I promised I'd be having a bourbon with you. So what's, what is your flavor this this afternoon? Uh, my, my flavor, I, I went this time with the Weller. Okay, see, that, know, uh, I don't even know that one. That's Yeah, I don't even know that one. That sounds fancy. Well, you know what? It's really not what it kind of is. Uh, Weller is actually, <clears throat> for people that are in the know, uh, you can get Weller for about $20, $25 if you can find it. Um, a lot of places are selling it for 40 50 upwards of $80. Um, the masses have started to find out that Weller is a young pappy. Okay. I Look, and, I, I can't, I'm not going to pretend to be like some bourbon savant, dude. I, drink, <laughs> I, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I got Maker's Mark. That's my bourbon. Hey, there's nothing wrong. I could pour some of that. I got a couple different versions of makers on the on the bar here. But dude, you're always like you're a wheeler dealer kind of guy, so you always got the deal, so you know where to get the good stuff on the cheap, don't you? Well, not you know, not necessarily. You know, you just uh, you talk to your guys, and uh, and if it comes in, uh, they take care of you. You know, it's uh, it's they get it for the good price. It's just a matter of supply and demand and what they want to ask for. It. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right, well, we are both uh, probably going to get a little lit because, I don't know, I haven't had dinner yet, so I'm drinking mine on an empty stomach. But, uh, Me too. <laughs> good, this could go any direction then. Um, but, but anyway, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked that we are uh, uh, reuniting under the Hookshots flag for this podcast because it, it, it's been a while. And I got to tell you, looking back all those years ago on that Mealy Master episode – when I told people I was going to Connecticut to shoot a, a video around fishing mealworms for trout, dude, people were like, really? That's nuts. And I started thinking to myself, like, yeah, it kind of is. Like, why the hell am I doing this? But I have, I have never gotten more feedback on any episode in 11 years that I have ever shot. And I think, and I think you'll back this up because I know a lot of people reached out to you. Like, more people. Oh, more people adopted what you were doing with mealworms because of that episode than like any other tactic I've ever shown in a video. It's, it's a cult following now, dude. Right. It has really, truly blown my mind. <clears throat> and I think I, I love it for that for one simple reason. You know, I, I started it because it was a passion. Right. You know, I wanted to take everything that I learned from tra from fly fishing and creating that perfect drift and the art of it and move it into the simplicity and the effectiveness of bait. Right. And when you put those two together, it's, it's deadly. But the thing is, your average Joe can do it. You know, even your average Joe Smelly can do it. You I, know? <laughs> so, I, I and, can. And, and that's what I grew up doing. And I hadn't done it for so many yeah. years. And it was so funny because the day that we were up there fishing the Farmington for that episode, I mean, there were a bunch of fly guys out, and like those are my people, and we were doing yeah. so well that like I had this head change in the moment. I swear to God, it was like, dude, look at these guys over here, like stroking it, dummies. You know what <laughs> I mean? But like, dude, those are my people. That's who I am. You know. But, but the thing is, I approach it like they're all my people. You know, the fly guys because. Fly guys will come up to me, and because the rod is longer, they don't always realize I'm spin fishing. Right. And right. so they'll say, hey, how are they hitting? And, I, you know, nine times out of ten, we're just destroying them. But I say, you know, not a lot of surface action. You know, I saw a couple, 
you know, saw a couple, you know, bluing dogs or whatever or something go by, whatever the hatch is going on, or, you know, nothing on the surface, everything's hitting deep. Yeah, you might. And so I still understand what these guys are looking for and all, but, you know, that mentality is just gone to, I, I can't get out of it, man. Well, it, it, it's it's become it, It's crazy, man. Because even some of the fisheries around here, um, you know, we have just just like you do. We have a lot of areas that are um, you know artificial only, you know, year round trout conservation areas. And yep. if, if I go up there with a fly rod, right, everybody wants to talk to me. Everybody wants to talk and see what's going on. If I go to those same places and I have a spinning rod with a jerk bait on it or something, nobody oh, wants to awesome. talk to me. Nobody wants to talk to me. Yet I, like you, talk to everybody no matter what I'm fishing, you know. Right. But it, 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 it's, it's, it's so funny because looking at it from a fly perspective, um, you know, a, a, everybody in fly, especially when you look at nymphing, what are they always trying to do? Like everything is about how to make a presentation or a fly look natural. And that's essentially all you've done with mealworm fishing. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it is. And, and I've even gone as far as, you know, trying the different sizes of mealworms. Right. You know, I always thought bigger was better and go to the, the super worms and all. <clears throat> they don't produce as well. Really? So, yeah, I, yeah I've, I've actually tried regular mealworms, giants, and supers, and the giants hand down outperform the smaller and the larger. Right. Right. Well, so we got we got to back up, and I mean, I know we've talked about this in the episode, and that, but that was that was quite a while ago at this point. So, um, you know, you you have done everything. You are fluent in the fly game and artificials. So, like, sort of, what's the quick version, man? Like for people who 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 aren't fluent in the old episode of of like sort of the progression that got you to mealy master status. There's actually like mealy master attire now, isn't there? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> mealy master. Yeah, absolutely, man. I got that for a bunch of my guys. It was awesome. Right. Uh, well, they, they all started picking up on it. Right. And, and you know, they, they try to explain it. And, uh, you know, it's ultimately, I started years ago with fishing with my grandmother as okay. a kid. When I was old enough to go out with the guys, you know, you, you always want to go with the guys. You always want to be old enough. And, you know, getting my first trout rod at that point, was a four-and-a-half-foot, ultralight, handmade Fenwick blank fishing rod. Right, right. Getting that was like getting my first gun. That was like a rite of passage into the adult fishing world. Sure. And so my grandmother was an amazing fisherman. God bless her. I mean, I wish she was around to see what's going on now because it was, uh, it, it was awesome. I loved, loved watching her fish. She was meticulous. Uh, taught me how to read water and everything. And then I was old enough to go with Dad and the guys. Right. And my father was a target fisherman. You know, he he could just look at a river and get it. And I just, I really just took in as much as I could from that bait presentation. And once you, once you get into that, fly fishing is so much more. It's entomo uh, entomology, you sure, know, sure. And, and you're learning the stages between a pupa and, a, and a, a, you know, your emerger, and then your spent. And, you know, all your different stages, not just one fly, but all the flies and what stages are in at what point in time. So then there's the presentations, and you've got, you know, your dead drift. You've got, you know, you can switch. You've got to mend your line. You've got you know, bead heads, and you do trailers, and all drop lines, all the different, you know, types of fishing. And I've done saltwater, freshwater, everything that fly. And to me, that was just more food for thought. Sure. That, that really sparked my interest because there was so much more to it. And when I got to a point where I was like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm good at this. I, I was never, I don't think I was ever very, um, I wouldn't consider myself an expert at it, but you know, 
I could I could throw a line down to the backing most of the time on a good rod. And right, right, right. It was uh, it just got to the point where I wanted more. Right. Because you don't catch as much fish. Right. You can have hot days and you can have good days, but more often than not, you're not catching as much as when you're using bait. But I didn't want to go back to just chucking worms and, and whatever. I wanted more of a challenge and figure out how to perfect it. So I was when I was doing saltwater uh, tournament fishing, I ended up hooking up with Eagle Claw. Right. And one of the guys at Eagle Claw, he was the director of marketing at the time. I believe he's with Shimano now. He, he sends me this rod. And he said, I'm sending you these ultralights. He goes, but I want you to try this longer rod. Can you do it? I go, yeah, I'll try it. So I started running. It was totally out of my style. But started really liking the act and kind of how you could control your drift a little bit more like you would if you were nymphing. Okay. Then I started changing my line, changing my hooks, changing my bait, changing the weight, changing everything about how I fished to adapt to this longer rod. And the rod kept getting longer. As you know, I was using the Fenwick 6.9 for a while. You know, so I kept trying to get upwards of that seven foot length. Sure. Well, I mean, even though this is this is worm fishing, I mean, your gear is is very dialed in to this. I mean, I remember as a kid, you you always wanted like smaller is better. Like I was always looking for like a five foot, you know, trout rod or whatever. um, You know, and you're fishing much longer, leaner, sort of more sensitive. My my ultralight now is a cadence uh, seven foot ultralight right right i, I mean finally found the speed that maintains an ultralight action at, that hits that seven foot uh length right which is very difficult right and and i mean you're still you 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 figured out this setup needs to go all the way down to two pound test to really make yeah. this the most and effective and it's four, mainline fluoro two pounds so basically i'm fishing with seven x tip at mainline right <laughs> right, you know? right, and you're using. So, let me see if I remember. Size twelve nymph scud hook. Exactly, that's right. exactly what it is. And the reason I chose that is because a bait hook is thicker and heavier. Right, and it just doesn't allow that worm to float as natural. And if I take weight off, and I've got a rising fish that may be rising two feet, you know, two three feet off the bank, I can drift a mealworm on the surface. And I'll tell you what, I don't care what that fish is rising for. You put a mealworm six inches above his nose and twitch it, and it's game over. Sure. And I mean, so, I mean, I know that you've told me, man, like a, a lot of the, the appeal of mealworm is that it just imitates so many things. Like I remember in the video you saying, it, this can be a grasshopper, this can be a nymph, this can be a thousand different things. Um, right. And that obviously to you is is more important than any other factor. I mean, there's just a lot of things that a mealworm can do presentation wise that a small red worm or garden worm or whatever just isn't going to do. I walk, I walk to the stream with hooks, two different size lead weights and mealworms. And, and you've, and you've been with me when you see what that can do. I mean, I, I no longer am I going to use a, a, uh, you know, a countdown Rapala, or am I going to use a, a Phoebe or a Meps, or am I going to use a rooster tail? You know, I don't have to worry about color. Am I going to use a fire tail rooster? Am I going to use, you know, right, right. a rainbow? You know, what am I going to use? Um, I, I bring one thing. Right. And that's it. Right. But see, now this is, this is, I think, sort of the nitty gritty, sort of the deeper stuff that, you know, we didn't really get to touch on in that, that, that video. So, you know, common knowledge among trout fishermen, no matter what the size of the fish, right, is that, what is it, 90% of their feeding will always take place subsurface. So dry fly, that's cool. Rising fish is cool, but that's not the norm. So most of their fish is, is, you know, most of their feeding is subsurface. So, I mean, you have a lot of guys out there, me in a lot of instances being one of them, that has that mentality when we trout fish, especially on the fly, like um, I'm, I'm a big streamer junkie, right? And I would, yep. Ra- yep. I would rather sacrifice numbers for a day on a float or a weight or whatever, 
and look for one, two, or three really good, you know, big browns. And there's yep. a, there's a lot to be said of that mentality of, um, you know, throw big and and you know you're doing your, your thing, and you're so confident in, in your way that you don't even factor that in anymore, right? That, there's it, it does not matter. I mean, we go out there. I actually talk to the state fisheries biologist uh, just a matter of a couple weeks ago. Okay. He asked me how I did on the river this year, and I said it was probably one of the most, I had a couple of the most epic days I've ever had. He goes, really? He goes, we heard reports that the big fish just aren't get, aren't, aren't there anymore. I said, well, I had a day where I caught, you know, I caught close to 30 fish, and six fish were between 18 and 23 inches. Right. And he couldn't believe it. And I showed him pictures. <laughs> then, right. And then I and I had another day where I caught, you know, two fish. One of them was, you know, five pounds plus, and the other fish was, um, you know, over twenty inches as well. But you know, not a five pound; it was much thinner. But we we catch the small ones, we catch the big ones. Those those fish are on the bottom, and the bigger fish traditionally. What a lot of people don't realize is that when they read water, even if there's no structure, the river has a minimum of four different speeds. Okay. Your your the the tension of the of the bottom of the river creates a slower drag sure. coefficient on the water. Sure. Then there's the center stream that goes. Then the air creates another friction. That's why you're constantly mending with a fly rod because that speed of your drift is different than the speed of the water on top. Right. So you have to compensate for that. Then as you get to the edges, now you've got air and, and ground that are much closer together that actually creates a different speed even yet. So you've got four different speeds to deal with. And when you have that super, super light line, you don't have to really even consider. The only thing I got to worry about is depth and speed. Right. And I adjust with a weight or two. And those big fish are going to get in those slip currents. They're going to get down to the bottom because that drag of the bait, whether or not there's big rocks or not, they're going to hug into a little seam in the bottom where that water is slower. And they're going to come up three or four inches to grab their bait, their food, and they're going to go back down. Right. They're lazy. They're big. They're fat. They're not going to expend the energy. Okay. So I think you know one of the most interesting things about your your use of mealworms within this presentation is that, um, I mean, it, it, it's also fair to say, right, that when you're out there doing this, I mean, you're looking for quote unquote real fish. So, I mean, if you look at, you know, like a really popular, we have a lot of opening days coming up, right? Your power baits right. and a lot of these synthetic mealworms and synthetic trout baits that are out there now, that's just not the kind of food that's going to have the same appeal to a wild fish. I mean, ultimately you're fishing for long-standing holdover and wild river fish, are you not? Correct. I do get a lot of, uh, you know, our streams around here are predominantly stocked. Right. But when I brought you, <clears throat> there is wild strains of fish. That monster brown that you caught yeah. was a wild fish. So um, they they have holdovers. They, uh, <clears throat> they tag their fish in the cheeks. So you can tell if a fish has been released or if it's wild or whatnot. Most of the fish there, you know, depending on the age, they clip the adipose fin on them so you can tell right away if it's a stock fish or not, um, but not all of them. Um, but, uh, you know, th this fishery, because so much of it is catch and release, it's a no-kill. Right. All these fish have already seen it, and most of these fish have been in there for a while. And um, they're educated. Yeah, I mean, it's I've a pretty had, it's a pretty heavily pressured fishery up there. I was, yep, it, it really is. I mean, um, 
you know, you're talking fish out in the Midwest. He probably, I dare say, you know, probably 70% less pressure right. per fish per square mile than our fish do. Sure. Sure. You know, our, our fish, I'll, I'll pull up fish that'll have, you know, big bruises that look like they got socks in the side of the mouth from getting caught so many times. Right, right. Well, I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's a matter of, uh, of population density. Now, I mean, when, when you and I fished, uh, the Farmington, I mean, it was incredibly high. And that really, oh, that it was flood stage. It was flood stage. That's right. But, yeah. but that, as I recall, really posed no, um, no challenge to what we were trying to do, whereas it would for almost any other method. So, I mean, the, the way that you're fishing with the two pound test now, as I recall it, right, you're using BB size split shot, one preferably. Either B, yep, either B or BB. Uh, those are the two smaller sizes. And depending on the depth and the speed, it's either one or a combination thereof, two or three, depending on how deep, how fast, and whatnot to get it to the bottom. Right. But my point... Should, my, when I say the bottom, it needs to bounce the bottom. It shouldn't get hung up. And sure, sure. It shouldn't hang. No, no, no. I know. Well, it, it really makes no difference, you know, like when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're mealworming, it doesn't really matter if the water is flood stage or low. It's right. much easier, to, easier to adapt to conditions than a lot of, Without say, fly techniques. Yeah. It, the biggest thing for me usually is visibility. Right, right. You know, the, if you can see it, that's, that's half the battle. Okay. So they still have to be able to see it. Um, you know, cause, but, uh, <laughs> So over the years, man, I mean, there there have to have been some scenarios out there where um, you've been not very well liked on a river surrounded by other guys, yeah? <laughs> Come on, man. You were right up to that day. <laughs> <laughs> that guy was pissed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I tried not to film him, but yes, he was pissed. But I mean, I really can't stress enough, though, you know, um, the, like what you do, it's, it's not about pulling a fish or two a day. I mean, you know, it's about going double digits, you know, almost yeah. every time or, or, if, if, you know, if I go up with another person on average, if we don't catch 30 to 40 fish between the two of us, we've had a bad day. Right. Right. And that's just so not the same numbers that the average guy can experience. I would say, no, I would say on average, we usually see, on a good day, six, eight, or ten fish being caught in total through everybody. Right. Uh, you no, know, it's not uncommon to only see, you know, two or three fish. Right, right. Caught. Yeah, I mean, so considering the numbers of fish that, that you catch, I mean, you got to give me one juicy skirmish, dude. There has to be something in memory that sticks out of, like, a you know, almost fist-thrown encounter on a river out there. You know what? I Honestly, Joe, there's not. I mean, I I don't like... 90% of the times, people encroach on me. Right. Because they think I'm in the hot spot. Right, 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 right. Um, I, I don't like moving in on people. Um, I do get looks because I'll, I'll sit back and fish a place that I've pretty much fished out and wait for someone to move, knowing that they're in a hot spot. Yeah, and which is kind of like the ultimate kick in the teeth, because I know I've watched you do <laughs> that. You'll just let some <laughs> poor dude beat on a hole for hours and catch yeah. one or two and then walk in behind him and smoke ten. Right, and and I mean, that guy in the video, um, he was actually using the same bait, ultralight, in that pool, and he had to have been there for a half hour, 45 minutes, and caught one fish, I think. And we went up, and I caught a few. And then Johnny came in, and he caught one. I, I know, man. I felt bad. I felt bad for that poor guy. You know, I, I, I really did. Um, but, you know, like, it's funny because I almost look at what you're doing as the equivalent of center pinning versus back trolling yeah. or fly fishing on – a steelhead river, you know, most most dyed in the right. wool steelhead guys will tell you that if you really want numbers on a steelhead river, you know, you you pin, uh, which is a tactic I'm not really that familiar. Pin is 
Have you ever done it? Have you pinned? I have not pinned, but I know what it is, and I know the whole concept behind it. And I do something kind of similar. Okay. Um, center pinning, if I'm not mistaken, it is, is a bobber fishing. You know, you're picking the depths, and you're making a perfect drift down that river. Yeah, and, and, and hypothetically, if you have the clearance to do it, you can make a 100-yard unimpeded, perfectly natural exactly. drift. Exactly. And what I've done is there. I use strike indicators. Strike a lot of strike indicators float. Yeah, they, they and, should. <laughs> you know, and you know, so um, you know the the whole thing is is that everybody thinks, oh, it's a strike indicator or your center pinning. It's a freaking bobber. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> no yeah. How yeah. You come look on, at that's it. the age old flyer. It it's a bobber. I, yeah, of course. It's a. It's a Bob, I know. I know. <laughs> so, you know. Call it what you want. Oh, sorry, it's a strike indicator. No, it's not. It's a bobber, dude. No, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I, I no, mean, n- nymph fishing. But, nymph fishing is essentially mealworming with a fly rod. I mean, that's all it really but, is. You know. And and you know, and I will. I'll take really slow drift areas that have, you know four inches of water that I know there's a fish. I can see him rising. He's a big fish. And I'll take a strike indicator. And because I've got two-pound test, I can cast fairly decent distance, get on him, and make that drift from 10, 15 yards above him and just let that sucker drop back through and just... He can't see the line. He can't see the hook. Right. It's... Well, you, you just said something important, you know, um, when you're scaling down to something as light as two pound test, which when I fished with you and used it, I mean, you, you have to know how to fight a fish to not break them off or not screw that up. Okay. Granted. So there is, there is a, a learning curve with scaling down the line oh, that you. small, but by the but same it's also token, part of fly fishing. sure. You know, I, I palm, I palm my reel. Right. Right, and you're, I know your drags are ultimately set to nothing. I remember doing more hand adjustment of of the drag yeah. than than letting the reel do it. But what I was going to say was, people I think don't realize uh, benefits like you mentioned. Like once you scale down that light, there's so much more you can do with a presentation that you couldn't do with say six pound. Which I think is fair to say is like what the average guy is probably spooling for opening day stream trout. So two pound does almost allow you to cast a bare mealworm or one with hardly any weight on it to where it needs to go. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the the two pound test and I I do got to say without a doubt, fluorocarbon makes a difference. Whether you're using two, four, six, eight, ten, I don't care. When I was doing tournament striper fishing, when we change from a mono leader to fluorocarbon, we got more hookups. Sure. You know, fluoro rocks. Sure. And um, two-pound, as it is, you can barely see it. You make two-pound fluoro, it's game over. Right, right. And it allows me to cast a mealworm with zero weight. I can't, you know, I can't whip it three-quarters of the way across the stream. Of course. But I can effectively cast and do and present to a fish that I'm within reasonable distance of. Right. And well, one of, one of my biggest one of my biggest fish was a giant rainbow that I got on video online, and he's huge, giant. And I threw it out. I saw him rise, and I threw it out. No weight whatsoever, and the thing is just drifting in the current. No strike indicator. No nothing. And he comes up to it, he he comes out of his own pattern, faces it about probably four or five inches from from the bait and froze and started drifting backwards with the drift. Huh. Like literally floated backwards with the bait, looking at it. I made one twitch and he came up and just went... Right. In right. Right. You know, right. It, it. He was poorly scrutinizing that bait. Yeah. And 
in the in the past, one thing that I've really felt fortunate about is being in on some rivers where I've been able to be at a point where the the holes are really deep. You can see the fish, right, and present to them to a point where you can try different styles. You can see different things. You can see when they deny your bait. Bring it in and adjust the exact same bait. Drift it back through and see that same fish come up and take it. Right. And I've seen that countless times. <clears throat> and this is one thing I try to impress on all my friends that I bring out and everything. Bait is cheap. Yeah. If a fish, if a fish hits my bait, I will, if I don't catch him on the next drift or two, I change it. I right. rip it off, throw a new one on, and chances are, more times than not, I will catch that fish on the next drift. Right, right. And one thing we didn't, well, one thing we didn't talk about too, Matt, like, um, just so people understand, we, we had said that you're using that, that size 12 nymph scud hook, and you're threading that, like, so just the tip comes out. So you're not, in other words, you're not, you're never presenting perpendicular. You're always presenting the worm in a straight line downstream. Yeah. Right. Right. And I, and it's always, you know, not only that, but the eye is inside right. the mealworm. I actually go through the back of the mealworm because if you, a, a scud hook has a natural curve to it. Sure. And there's part, the reason why it shows a scud hook is because, because of that curve. When you, when you hook a regular mealworm, they want to curl up into a little, you know, Cheerio. Right, right. So um, if you do it through their belly, you've got a circle, you know, and, and it just doesn't look natural. Uh, if you do it with a straight shanked hook, they can still curl a bit. Right. When you do it with that curved one that's bending the opposite way that they want to curl, right. it keeps them straighter and presents them more open. Gotcha. And I have absolutely found the difference in that. <clears throat> but, you know, back to, you know, the, the denying of the bait, I've drifted through and seen a fish come up <clears throat> and deny my bait, bring it in, look at it, and say, holy crap, the, fr the freaking eye is showing. Right, right. Pull the eye in. Pull the eye in on the exact same bait, do the same drift, that fish comes up and takes it. And I mean, doesn't scrutinize and take it. I mean, takes it. Hits. Well, there, you know, there's a lot. In my mind, the inherent nature of how they can scrutinize so quickly and see a difference, it's, it blows my mind. Well, dude, it's funny, isn't it? Because, you know, you talk to dry fly guys and they'll, they'll lament sort of the same things about presentation and like, oh man, like something was just like a, 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 like a, just a hair off of that drift stopped that trout from eating it. And they seem so smart. And then at other times they just seem so dumb. So like, which is it? You know what I mean? Like I've heard it go both ways when it comes to trout. I've heard some really smart trout anglers go, you know, at the end of the day, man, they're pretty dumb. But, you know, are they really? Right. right. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with the nature of the bite. You know, it, we, we fish not just trout but bass and, and, and just about any species out there. There are days when the bite is on. Sure, sure. Whether it's barometric pressure or what it may be, there's something that has triggered the feed. When the feed is on, you can't go wrong. But time and time again, to duplicate success, there has to be a reason behind it. And I've found that fresh bait put on 100% correctly, if it gets hit, it's not the same. You know, it, it's... It, there, there has to be something different about it. Why he didn't come back and take that? Sure, so, sure. Um, to to duplicate success is that's the key because you're saying, you know, just like you said, there, there's hot days and there's cold days, and I have days where I don't catch a lot. But my my days where I don't catch a lot, number one, are further and few between. Right, but. Also, I still catch a lot on those 
<laughs> well, you, you 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 had said like you know bait's cheap and you change it often and you know to with that yeah. in mind, I think that it's important for people to understand right that Matt Wettish is not going out and buying the little Dixie cup of mealworms at a time, right? What time of year do you order and how many do you have <laughs> on hand at all times? It's funny you just said that. I was I was just written up in entomology today. <laughs> <laughs> big, there is big, like, tell me it was the biggest mealworm order ever ever there, ever put in. It, figure this out, man. There's like this fifteen year study or something like that for because of mealworms obviously being a consumable for humans, not sure. that I you know sure I chewed on that one in the video, but yeah. It's viewed as a food as a food source, you know. Not that I'm going to go out and buy a whole bunch and start chewing on them instead of a steak, but ultimately, it's a big thing. And they've been studying how to create a stronger, healthier strain of mealworms for human con- for human consumption. You mean? It, well, for everything, right? For human consumption, they're using them as like feed now, and in all sorts of stuff. Okay. So they heard about. The Mealy Master, <laughs> <laughs> and wanted my take on how I choose my mealworms. Really? And I no no bullshit, man. <laughs> and I and what's funny is that you know, like I said before, I've I've tried regulars, giants, supers. I've done the whole thing as well. I've done, you know, the the. You know, urine sample jars that you can buy for two fifty or three bucks a piece or whatever in your stores. Right. Well, it's funny you because know, I think the average person probably doesn't even realize there are that many mealworm choices. You know, because yeah. most bait shops have it's just like, dude, here it's this or nothing, right? Because I I grew up with the Dixie cup, so yeah, exactly. So I have tried because I use so many. It doesn't make sense for me to spend two uh, two two fifty or whatever it is now. I can't. I buy them by the thousands. Okay. So I have tried all over the country. I've tried, you know, places where you can buy in somewhat bulk and all that. And without a doubt, rainbow mealworms, I'm going to pump them. Rainbow mealworms, yeah, get them. Yeah, do it, dude. They are, they are out of Compton. So Wait, Compton I'm, like L.A.? Yeah, yes, dude. I am getting you a shirt. I'm making them this spring. Get the f- out of here. Bait. Compton? Like yeah, Dr. Dre out, Compton? Dude, bait out of Compton. <laughs> <laughs> bait out of Compton. Oh, bait shit. Bait out of Compton, baby. I'm doing the shirts. I'm making them. Bait out of Compton. You know how it had the, you know, the, uh, the language advisory mm-hmm. logo? Mm-hmm. Yep, I'm doing the fishing advisory. Extremely effective. Bait out of Compton. I'm doing the whole deal. I'll take five. <laughs> black t shirt black t shirt with the with the whole you know black and white lettering yeah yeah made out of Compton, baby now for for people who might wanna follow in your footsteps and and buy mealworms in bulk um you have to do a little bit of mealworm care, yeah, you have a system, tell me about it, how you store them, and they have to be fed right I mean, I know you don't name all of them you don't name them all, but you know. <laughs> You put them in your beer fridge. Right. Um, you know, uh, mama may get mad at you or whatever, your girl, your wife, whatever. Um, but the thing is, they don't smell. Yeah. You take them out of their container when they get there. They get there packed in like newspaper. Okay. You take them out. You put them in oatmeal. Oatmeal. That's and, right. Okay. Yeah. And that's it. And that's what they feed on and whatnot. And you take them out. Every couple weeks, every two, three weeks, and you throw a couple slices of either potato or apple or something on there because that's how they get their moisture. They eat their moisture. Right. So they come up, you put them in a closet for like 24 hours or 48 hours, let them chew on those, on those pieces and, um, and then just put them back in the fridge. When they go in the fridge, they go into a hibernation. Okay, so the, but the important thing here, right? Because everybody knows to keep their uh, garden worms, night crawlers, and stuff in the fridge. But 
I think that's the most critical piece of the puzzle here for what you're saying because I'm sure I'm not the only person, right, especially not listening to this, that, like, bought some f***ing mealworms in April and then you go dig around in your trout vest in August and there's, like, a whole goddamn Dixie cup full of moths in there, right? So that's (laughs) – and you're like, holy shit, right? It's weird. But that's a problem you don't have and that's all the fridge, right? So in other words, you let them come up to to temperature just to feed – but then, otherwise, the cool keeps right them from the it keeps them from turning into into moths. Right. Yeah. They it's it basically puts them into a hibernation where they don't continue their growth status, which they'll go into a beetle and so forth. Okay. So here's the next thing that I want to talk about. Right. Okay. So we we've established the the technique and how to keep thousands of mealworms at your humble abode. Um, <laughs> So, you know, your home waters are up in Connecticut, but yep. how far and wide so far, and don't spill the beans on your big trip yet, because I do want to talk about that, but how far and wide have you have you taken this? Where have you traveled with the Mealy Master Tactics and been, um, you know, successful with it? Because I remember when we, when we were hanging out, you had, you weren't really joking, but, but you were kind of saying that you would love someone to show you around Pulaski, New York, during steelhead right. season because you firmly believe you can go up there with exactly the same shit and exactly the same game and whoop steelhead on mealworms. I mean, you, you, you're right. confident in that? Well, I, what I wanted to do in, in, uh, in um, Pulaski is I want to go up there, not necessarily mealworms. I want to go up there with ultralight and hit the tributaries. Okay, so the smaller streams. Right, exactly. I want to go in there with smaller gear and not go asses to elbows with people and get off the beaten path. I mean, that's what I dig. Um, I haven't, I've done around the Northeast, around New England, and it has been effective in every trout river that I've fished. Sure. Well, I do. I got to tell you that. I have guys that that have written me and. Just unbelievable, you know, the stories I get from guys that are across the country. I've got a teacher that's out west. Right. And, you know, um, he said it's changed the way I think. I had one guy, dude, it, it brought tears to my eyes. I got I got to I got to tell you about this. And and this is because of your your video. Uh oh. Okay. Okay. There was there is a police officer in Connecticut. That wrote me, and I could give, I could send you what he wrote. Um, he had kind of post traumatic view, right? Okay, okay. And he loved fishing, and he was fishing. He watched the video, duplicated what I'm doing, and he said it's changed his life. That's powerful, he dude. Bring- He's bringing his kid out. He's doing the whole thing, um, teaching his kid the mealy master way, you know, the whole deal. And I actually was on the river. He was going to be there, and he, he texted me, and he goes, uh, I miss you, you know, and I, and, uh, I said, well, I'm heading to the brewery down the road. We're going to have fun to eat and stuff like that. And he goes, I just left. So we ended up at the brewery. All of a sudden, I turn around, I look, and I recognize the guy from pictures. Right, right. Not to mention, you know, he's like 6'2", six 6'3". Six <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So he comes over, and I meet the guy, and I give him a big hug and everything, and I see his kid, and he introduces me to his son, and his wife is there. And she... She, I give her a hug, and she whispers in my ear, you have no idea what you did for this family. Oh, dude, you're going to make me cry. Come on. Dude. It could I'm be not, the bourbon. I, but, I did. Right. I did, man. <laughs> I mean, it, it, that was so crazy. Sure. You know, to hear that, and it was so cool, and it, it was just, it was awesome. You know, it was unbelievable. Well, you know, I I meant what I said in the beginning of this, that, like, I've never gotten more feedback on an episode ever. And, you know, the the crazy thing is, is that 
yeah, you know, bait fishing for trout it just has such a terrible connotation of being like dumbed down meathead kind of shit. But then when you break it down the way you're doing it, it's so technical and so thought out. Because even if well, you never adopt this, what you can learn just by listening to you as a fly guy, like if, like it, it, to me, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. To me, it's it's fishing and understanding fish, and that that's all it is. Whether or not you do it with your fly fishing, your spin fishing, your bait casting, um, it, it's just understanding habits and cycles, and whether or not you're doing it with flies or uh, terrestrials or streamers, you know, when, when you look at, you're using streamers, right? You know, what stage of a streamer, what stage of a, of a bait fish life are you doing? Are you doing something that's going to be an inch long? Are you going for more adult size? You know, it all depends, you know, go big or go home, I guess. You know, uh, dude, I'm just, I'm just about whatever it takes to rip some lips, bro. No, right. I'm just you know, kidding. So, I'm just kidding. That's like the stock streamer guy answer. Yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> just put a six-inch streamer on there, and if it doesn't hit, I don't want to catch it. Exactly. That's, I'm only about two footers, bro. Um, right? But, dude, we got to – and I don't want to – you know, I don't want to jinx it, but, like, we got I, we got to talk about your, your pending trip uh, because, in a nutshell, <laughs> Matt called me this winter, and this is this is the basic gist, and I know it's changed a little bit. But your proposal to me was like you basically want to go to Montana to all the holy waters that like Norman McLean fished and just beat the shit out of him with mealworms. Dude, I'm 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 gonna dip my worm in holy water. <laughs> <laughs> and then Matt wants contact. He's like, Do you have anybody out there that can help me out? I'm like, not that's gonna fucking talk to you. I don't. <laughs> But this not, is <laughs> not if you want to come back off the river. <laughs> but this is coming together. The Mealy Master is doing Montana this summer, isn't he? I'm doing it. Yeah, I'm going to Bozeman, bro. Nice. Okay, so not quite doing, McLean's I'm waters, doing, but I'm doing, I'm doing Blue Ribbon River, so man, I'm going in, and uh, yeah, we're we're gonna beat the hell out of some out of some trout rivers out in Bozeman, and uh, we're gonna hit it hard, man. But you actually have have bumped, gotten some contacts out there that have been like, tell me about it. Like, fairly amenable to the idea, cold shoulder, like you know, blowing you off. Like, no, what's you been the what? vibe? I, I, I've been. What, what's really cool was uh, I, I. There's a photography friend of mine that's out there, and he's given me some good insight, and it's been good. Um, but I'm like, I, I need somebody who's on the water. Sure. You know, I sure. I think you no know, guy that's guiding and, and doing this. So I just Googled trout fishing, you know, trout stores out there. Right. And I'll throw a bone to the store because this guy talked to me for probably over a half hour. I got on the phone with uh, Montana Trout Fitters. Uh-huh. Okay. And they're right down at Bozeman. This guy gets on the phone and, you know, I told him what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it, and, you know, I wanted a timeline. So I didn't get hit with too much runoff and whatnot. Sure, and, you know, sure. when would be the optimum time to be there? And told them how I wanted to target them. And I said, then I kind of alluded to how I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of lifting the skirt, you know. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what, you know, pretty much, you know, he's like, you know, that's like going out on a date with a hot chick and seeing she has an Adam's apple. Right. You know? <laughs> so. Well, you know what? So. No, it's, it's, it, dude, it's a funny deal, man. Like, it's, it's just the vibe. And I, to any of my Montana friends listening, I've given Matt some spots. But um, if you see him in one of your spots, I'm not the one that gave him that one. So don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, the guy at Trout Fitters, I, I won't say his name because I don't want him shunned out of the place. But right. He said, don't let any of these guys fool you. He goes on their off days or out there chucking metal. <laughs> they well, want to catch fish. <laughs> dude, I, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget, and I'm not naming names either, and this was years ago, but the first time I ever fished Montana uh, was my high school graduation present. My dad took me out there, and we, um, we, we got guided on foot by one of the big shops outside of Bozeman in West Yellowstone. And not knowing yep. the scene, we brought fly rods and spinning rods. We brought everything, right? We didn't know what the deal was. 
And uh, sure. I, I remember walking the river with a fly rod with this this young guide, and I said something about like, you know, do you think I should bring my spinning rod out with us? Like, should I carry both? And his answer to me was, uh, I wouldn't even know what to tell you to do with a spinner. And even like seventeen year old me was like. What do you mean you wouldn't know what to tell me what to do with it? It's like if you don't know what to do with that, then like you're a fucking idiot. You know what I mean? Like, right. like you know, it's fine if that's not your scene, but don't say like I wouldn't even know what to do with that. Well, you're stupid. You know. So I don't know. Wow. God, God bless, yeah, man. This, this guy was all about it. Yeah. This guy thought it was awesome. He said pretty much what you said. He said you're going to kill him. Yeah. And 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 you are, and uh, you know, every trickle of water that you see out there is worth your time. And uh, I'm actually sorry that I can't come on this one. I wish I could because it is going to be, it's going to be something to behold, man. The Mealy Master takes Montana. That's like a Chuck Norris kind of title. Right, exactly. Mealy Master goes west. I want, I want a twenty-seven inch. Freaking Brown out of Bozeman, Montana on two pound test. The Mealy Master takes Montana. That is a real thing that's happening, Montana. So uh, sorry if you're the uh, tourist out there on the river trying trying so hard to uh, get a big old cutty to uh, smack your salmon fly or something. And Matt rolls up next to you uh, because he's just going to school you with his mealworms from Compton. From his with his with his bait out of Compton. Hey, quick note: if Matt's audio is a little rough in this, apologies. If there's one thing that I have learned uh, with this whole podcast thing, it's I am at the mercy of somebody's cell connection when recording. But be that as it may, you heard him. You absorbed the wisdom. You could hear him clearly enough to absorb the wisdom of his mealworm and ways. And um, I cannot stress enough uh, just how powerful what the man is doing. Uh, is on any trout stream, so it is it is food for thought for you guys gearing up for those opening days or where seasons have already started. And while I will not be able to join Matt on his Montana adventure, I'm very serious about the steelhead thing. You know, um, he can't I, <laughs> he can't do it with two. He can't do it with two pound tests. Okay, steelheaders, you know this. Okay, so he might have to change his his tactics uh, just a little tiny bit. But I don't see. Um, why that wouldn't work, right? Okay, for anybody out there who, who does the Great Lakes steelhead thing, yes, it you know it, it, it revolves around eggs and things like that. But of course, you can also nymph those fish. They'll also eat a black stonefly or something like that. And you know, I think one of the things that maybe Matt didn't talk about, but, but the way I perceive it is the other thing about mealworms is there's a color contrast. Not only is it a natural food source that can represent a whole lot of things, it's also got that little bit of you know sort of orange, you know, standout egg color. Uh, kind of going for it, which, which trout, be they stockers or wild, seem to recognize. And I don't, I don't see why um, a steelhead wouldn't wouldn't suck that up uh, as quickly as as any stream trout out there. So that would be a lot of fun. I think that would be interesting and something I'd definitely like to go mess around with with him. Now, for anybody that wants to see wettish. In action, okay. As you know, as I mentioned, there is a hook shots episode, lessons from the Mealy Master, that you can find on uh, our page or on the Field and Stream YouTube channel. But Matt actually has his own YouTube channel that he's had for a whole lot of years, and that is Real Outdoors TV. So that's YouTube.com backslash Real Outdoors TV, and it is chock full of mealworm fishing videos in all different kinds of water conditions. You know, he's got high water stuff in there. He's got low summer water stuff in there in those times of year when the average, you know, bait or conventional trout guy is done. You know, because that's sort of the other thing about these these opening seasons. A lot of the places in Jersey where I grew up fishing where they dump trout, it's like, yeah, they'll uh, they'll be okay in there, you know, April, May, and June. But um, by July, by and large, they're dead. Okay, and people for or you know, or people just forget about it. And um, you, you know, if you know where to look, you might find a holdover or two. Matt knows where to look, and he knows how to adapt his strategy for those clear, low summer flows to catch those fish. So there's a lot to learn there. And uh, if you watch some of his videos, man, it's like a rabbit hole. You know what I mean? Like you you start watching, and you know he's narrating and talking, and you get sucked right in. 
and you know you're rooting for him. You know you're watching a, a 22 inch brown on the Farmington just you know stripping off that two pound test, and you're going, oh god, you know. But um, it's it's very cool, and it's it's worth watching it in action just to see how he sort of holds his line and high sticks to pick up on those takes. You know, I, and I really can't stress enough. Um, and I don't harp on it, but nothing bothers me more than the trout fishing rift. Like, you know, I know a lot of fly guys. I know a lot of conventional guys. And when I hear fly guys essentially shitting on anybody who does it any other way, um, it really pisses me off. You know, it, it really does. Um, and let me tell you something, point of fact, and, and if you're a smart fly guy, uh, you won't deny this. Some of the best fly fishermen out there, they all started out conventionally fishing. They all started out running worms, okay? Um, you know, that's great if you found fly fishing and that's all you've ever done. Um, but there's so much to learn about fly fishing from guys like Matt or uh, you know, guys on the White River, conventional guys in Arkansas that do nothing but throw stick baits and swim baits. So I would hope that there's a, a you know, for for anybody listening to this who's just like, ah, I just, you know, I can't, I can't make that switch, or I'm, I'm never going to be the guy out there with worms. That's fine, man. You know, you do it how you want to do it. But I hope that there's some nugget from what Matt says that you can pluck out of this, you know, about uh, water speed or presentation or things he's noticed with the minutia of fish, you know, um, snubbing a mealworm that the hook eye is exposed out of and then sliding that hook eye back into that worm and having the same fish not hesitate at all and come clobber it, okay? Uh, the little details like that apply to a lot of different styles of fishing. So for anybody that does have a pending trout season opener coming, okay, you're busy scrubbing the rust off the chain stringer with some steel wool, okay, I hope you are the parking lot king, old school style, don't ever, don't ever let that tradition slip away like I did, okay? Don't be me. You get out there and you kick some opening day ass. And if you do it Matt Wedder style, you will kick more opening day ass, okay, than ever before. In any case, I will catch you guys right back here in two weeks. As always, thanks so much for listening to the Hook Shots podcast. Hook Shots podcast.